welcome to another episode of Hendrix's High Yield Pediatric Topics. Today's high yield topics are pediatric exanthems. Remember, an exanthem just describes a rash on the skin. So any rash on the skin is considered an exanthem. If you see lesions on the inside of the mouth, then that is considered an inanthem. Very quickly, let's review some dermatologic terms because those are going to be important. A macule is a flat lesion that's less than one centimeter. A papule is a raised lesion that's less than one centimeter. Now this changes a little bit depending on what textbook you're looking at. Some texts use the cutoff of half a centimeter, some texts use the cutoff of one centimeter. But the one centimeter is more widely used and so that's what we'll use here. If you're talking about a large macule, so something larger than one centimeter that is flat, then that is considered a patch. If you're talking about a large papule, so something larger than a papule, larger than one centimeter, raised but larger than one centimeter, then that's called a plaque. If you have something that is raised and fluid filled and the fluid inside looks clear, that's called a vesicle. If the fluid inside looks purulent or looks like it is pus, then that's called a pustule. A large vesicle, so larger than one centimeter, but filled with clear fluid is con considered a bulla. Okay, so let's move on. Talking about our first infectious exanthem, measles. Measles is a rash that starts at the head and spreads downward, right? The rash is usually described as being maculopapular, so they're small lesions, they're erythematous, they can be flat and raised, and they tend to all link up together so that the entire person is covered. If you Google measles, you will see those classic cases of people just covered head to toe in a rash. Rash starts at the head and spreads down. Remember, anytime you're seeing a child who has a rash, you always want to ask where it started and how it has spread, because that's going to help you in your differential diagnosis. Before the rash of measles, we see the classic prodrome. That classic prodrome is three C's and a K. The first C stands for conjunctivitis, the next C is cough, and the last C is coryza. Coryza just means a head cold. The K stands for a coplic spot. Coplic spots are usually described as white lesions on the buccal mucosa. Sometimes they're considered to be a little bit ulcerated. Sometimes described as looking like salt sprinkled on the inside of the mouth on the buccal mucosa. Three C's and a K. Usually as those are resolving along with fever, as that's resolving, then the rash comes. Rash starts at the head, spreads downwards. Measles is incredibly contagious. That's part of the reason why when we have a measles outbreak, it really spreads everywhere. It's highly, highly contagious. You get vaccinated for measles at age one year and again at age four years. Um, and that's in the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. That vaccine is a live vaccine. So we don't give it until they're one year of age. And then we give the booster at age four years, after which they're considered to be immune to measles unless they have an immunodeficiency. The most important sequelae of measles are encephalitis and pneumonia. Those are two of the most deadly consequences of measles. The rash of measles lasts for longer than three days, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and the treatment of measles is supportive care. It's a virus, so there's not a lot that you can do for it. In severely malnourished individuals, vitamin A has shown to help improve the recovery from measles, um, but in people who aren't malnourished, vitamin A does not help very much. So that's measles. Moving on to rubella. Rubella is also known as three-day measles because typically the rash in rubella lasts less than three days. That's one of the reasons the diagnostic criteria for measles is that the rash has lasted longer than three days. Because it's, if it's less than three days, we think about it being rubella. Um, for rubella, you do not have the cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, and coplic spots. You do usually have a prodrome of some fever. You can have some URI symptoms. Instead of the coplic spots, we see what's called Forsheimer spots. Forsheimer spots are also lesions on the inside of the mouth. They tend to be on the palate. They tend to be more erythematous than white. Um, and the rash is very similar to measles. Macules, papules, erythematous, um, and it starts at the head and spreads downwards usually lasts less than three days. That's rubella. 
The important thing to remember about rubella is rubella is very, very, very dangerous for pregnant women. It's most dangerous for the fetuses of pregnant women. It can cause congenital rubella syndrome. Congenital rubella syndrome is one of the torch infections um, and it can lead to fetal demise. It can cause cataracts, it can cause that blueberry muffin baby, which is when you get that extra medullary hematopoiesis. Um, so you'll have the skin um, starting to try to make red blood cells because the bone marrow is so suppressed. Um, you can get severe deformations, congenital heart defects with um, congenital rubella syndrome. So we test all pregnant women who are receiving prenatal care to see if they are immune to rubella. If they are not immune to rubella, we don't give them the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine because remember that's a live virus vaccine. Not while they're still pregnant, but as soon as they give birth to that baby or are no longer pregnant, then we give them the MMR vaccine to get them that rubella immunity. Once and again, the MMR vaccine is a live virus vaccine. We give it at age one year and again at four years. It's part of our routine vaccination series. So that's measles and rubella. Moving on to varicella. Varicella is chicken pox. Chicken pox classically has lesions of every descriptor, all those descriptors that we talked about in the beginning. They will start as erythematous macules. They will turn into erythematous papules. They will become fluid filled. They'll turn into vesicles. And that's that classic descriptor of the dewdrop on the rose petal. So it'll be a vesicle on an erythematous base. Then they will become pustular. That clear fluid will become purulent. And then those pustules will break open and crust over. So pathognomonic for a varicella is looking at a single patch of skin on one patient and being able to see a macule, a papule, a vesicle, a pustule, and a crust. And it's incredibly pruritic. So these patients are scratching and scratching. Um, so that's varicella. The sequelae, the most dangerous sequelae of varicella are very similar to measles, encephalitis and pneumonia. That's what patients tend to die of when they have varicella. Um, they can also get secondary skin infections. They're scratching at those lesions, scratching open those crusts. So you really want to try to encourage them not to scratch, try to give them good um, antipyritic medications, um, and have the parents really watch out for any secondary skin infections so that you can treat those quickly. Um, for varicella, the big question that comes up on the boards or on the COMAD exams is, the parents want to know when the child can return to school or return to daycare. And a child is considered no longer contagious with varicella once all of the lesions have crusted over. So you don't have to wait for all the lesions to completely heal, um, but as long as all the lesions are completely crusted over and you're not getting any of those new progression of lesions, then the child's not considered contagious and it's safe for them to go back to school. Um, now let's move on to erythema infectiosum. Erythema infectiosum has a bunch of different names. It's also known as slap cheek. Um, it's also known as parvovirus B19, because that's what causes it. Um, erythema infectiosum or slap cheek will look like very brightly erythematous patches on the child's cheeks. It'll look like somebody slapped them or like they have a, had a sunburn on the cheeks. Um, parvovirus tends to then progress into this beautiful lacy reticular rash on their arms and legs. It can definitely cause some um, arthralgias, so they may have some joint pain. It can cause the gloves and socks syndrome, where their hands and their feet are brightly erythematous or even purple. Um, parvovirus is, once again, very, very dangerous for pregnant women or really the fetuses of pregnant women because it can cause hydrops fetalis. Um, pyrovirus B19 can also um, suppress the bone marrow or affect the erythroid precursors. So in patients that have sickle cell anemia or thalassemias or other blood disorders, if they develop parvovirus, they um, may eventuate into aplastic crisis. So something that you want to remember for that. Erythema infectiosum, parvovirus, dangerous for patients that have sickle cell or thalassemia, dangerous for fetuses because it can cause hydrops fetalis. And that brings us to roseola. Roseola is caused by human herpes virus 6 or HHV6. It's one of my favorites because we see it all the time and the clinical presentation is classic. In this, 
The patients usually have a high fever for a few days, two to three days, very high fever up to 104, 103. The kids are usually pretty cranky and irritable. The parents bring them into the pediatrician's office or to the emergency department and you can't find anything wrong with the child. They don't have a urinary tract infection, they don't have an acute otitis media, they just have this really high fever. And then, as soon as the fever breaks, so they have the really high fever, as soon as that fever breaks, they break out in a rash. This time it usually starts at the belly and spreads outward. Just like varicella, chicken pox starts on the trunk and spreads outwards, um, as does roseola. These are usually erythematous papules, they can be some erythematous macules, and usually the child feels absolutely fine once they get the rash. The rash usually lasts a day or two and then goes away. So the parents may bring their child back in and say they no longer have the fever but now they have this rash and you can give them reassurance because they have roseola which is a virus. Another viral exanthem that we're going to talk about is hand, foot, and mouth. Hand, foot, and mouth is also seen very commonly in the clinic. It's caused usually by Coxsackie A virus, although there are some other causes of hand, foot, and mouth. Hand, foot, and mouth, usually the patients present with a high fever and a refusal to eat. Um, and the parents may say it seems like their throat hurts. It's usually in younger kids, so ages two, three, or younger. Um, parents may say, I think their throat hurts or they don't want to eat or drink anything. And then you take a look in their mouth and it's because they have all of these ulcers in their mouth from the hand, foot, and mouth disease. Um, you look on their hands, the palms of their hands, the soles of their feet, and they have these erythematous, sometimes brownish, um, sometimes they can be a little bit white with an erythematous border macule on their palms and their soles. Usually the parents haven't even noticed that. And then sometimes they can get little ulcerations or lesions right in the perianal um, region as well. So it should be called hand, foot, mouth, and bottom disease. Um, so those are all our infectious exanthems of childhood. In summary, we have measles. Measles has three C's and a K. Cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, and coplic spots. Starts at the head, spreads down. Um, the most dangerous sequelae of measles are encephalitis and pneumonia. Then we have rubella. Rubella is three-day measles, very similar to measles. You may have some fever, some malaise as a prodrome. You may see the Forsheimer spots. And then it also has a rash, macular papular, starts at the head, spreads down. Um, that will last for three days, hence the name three-day measles. We have the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, which we give at age one year and at four years. The most important thing to remember for rubella is congenital rubella syndrome, which is very dangerous, especially if exposed during the first trimester of pregnancy. So you want to protect pregnant women, make sure they're immune to rubella, um, and educate them on it. Then we have varicella or chickenpox. Chickenpox starts at the um, trunk and then spreads outward. That has the classic multiple phases on one patch of skin where you'll see um, papules, macules, vesicles, pustules, and crusts. Varicella is no longer contagious once all of the lesions have crusted over. Um, the sequelae of varicella include pneumonia and encephalitis. Um, then we have erythema infectiosum caused by parvovirus, B19. Um, parvovirus has that slapped cheek appearance. You can get the lacy reticular rash. You can get arthralgias from parvovirus. You can get the gloves and socks syndrome. And parvovirus is also very dangerous to fetuses. It can cause hydrops fetalis. It can also cause aplastic anemia in patients that already have some erythroid um, precursor issues, so sickle cell anemia or thalassemia. Um, then we have roseola. Roseola has a high fever for two to three days um, that once the fever resolves, they get a rash, starts at the trunk and spreads outward. Um, and then finally, hand, foot, and mouth disease. They can have lesions inside the mouth, usually fever. Usually the kids are very uncomfortable. They'll have some lesions on their hands, on their feet, oftentimes in their um, perennial region too. Sorry, my phone's falling down. Um, all of these are viruses, so we usually just treat with supportive care um, and trying to keep them away from others so that they don't spread their infections. And that's it. Thank you so much. Please give me feedback.